Our linear algebra project will explore the simplex algorithm and its applications to gaming and aviation. We will start by introducing, introducing the simplex algorithm. Then we will walk through the steps to solve the linear program and conclude with the algorithm's applications. Introduction and overview. During the Second World War, while, while he was conducting research for the U.S. Air Force, George Danzig, an American mathematician of the mid-20th century, came across an interesting and simpler way of solving linear programs. After further research, in 1947, he introduced what we call today the simplex algorithm. We use the simplex algorithm to minimize or maximize the value of a function over an area defined by equalities or inequalities. We also use it to obtain the best possible solution to a linear program. Let's walk through the example here. What you see is the general form of a linear program with n variables and m constraints. It is just a list of multiple equalities or inequalities of the form ka x1 plus k2 x2, etc. Larger, smaller, or equal to a constant c. These constraints eventually define an area that we call the feasible region. If we only had two variables, x1 and x2, the constraints would, are mainly lines and the feasible region fits in the xy plane as we can see on the graph down here. Now, an overview of solving linear programs. The general steps to solve a linear program are first, we will start with a problem that we will convert to linear constraints or what we call the general form that you just saw. Then we will transfor transform the linear program to standard form, then transform it again to slack form by following a predefined set of rules that we will explain later. Finally, we apply the simplex algorithm to the, to the linear program slack form and iterate until we find the desired solution. So once we have a linear program, we first have to convert it into standard form before we can apply the simplex method. It is basically a baseline format that ensures that we find the solution to the simplex method as efficiently as possible. We have to ensure three things. First, it has to be a maximization problem. If it is a minimizing problem, we multiply through by negative one. Secondly, the constraints need to be less than or equal inequality in this format. Lastly, the, the variables need to have a non-negative constraints. Here we can see an example. In this example, we can see a linear program, which is not in standard form. We multiply the minimizing problem and the inequality by negative one to get it into, into the standard form. Now we have to bring it into slack form, where we, where we add slack variables to turn the inequalities into equalities. This ensures that the constraints will have a definite answer. As you can see here, in the inequalities, we added three separate slack variables, S1, S2, and S3, to turn them into equalities. So now that we've looked at the background of uh, slack variables and standard form, let's dive into what the simplex algorithm actually is and how to understand it and compute it well. So as an overview, the simplex algorithm can be split into two primary components. The first is that of finding a basic solution to the given linear program. And after that, to find pivot variables and using those variables to pivot or iterate until an optimal solution to the given linear program is found. So there are a few strategies to, you know, first find the basic solution and then optimize the solution. But um, based on all the ones we came across, we agreed that this method we are about to portray here is the most efficient and most straightforward to explain. So the first step of this method is to create a tableau. And um, this tableau is employed, of which I'll have an example on the next slide, is employed in order to perform row operations on the linear programming model, and then to check the solution for optimality efficiently and easily. One important step in checking the solution for optimality is finding the pivot variables, which this tableau method makes very straightforward and efficient. Um, and the tableau is composed of two primary methods, uh, of two primary components, excuse me. The first are the coefficients corresponding to the linear constraint variables, and the second are the coefficients of the objective given function. So let me explain this better through an example. 
So um, we are given a linear program, which is to maximize the function z equals 8x1 plus 10x2 plus 7x3. And you can see the two equations incorporating the slack variables under that. Now, you can see the corresponding tableau on the right. And a couple things to know are that the first row um, represents what each column of the tableau stands for. So you can see, you know, x1, x2, x3, the two standard variables, zeta, va zeta value and the beta value. Um, following two rows represent the linear constraint variable coefficients, which correspond directly to those in the slack variable functions. So you can see, you know, for x1, that the coefficients are 1 and 1, for x2, 3 and 5, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the last row finally represents the coefficients corresponding to the objective function, which is the original function 8x1 plus 10x2 plus 7x3. This tableau in and of itself makes it very easy to visualize all the different components you're working with and more efficiently reach um, an optimal solution. So now that we have a tableau and we have all our information set in an organized and easy to read manner, uh, we need to check for optimality. And this is where the efficiency of the tableau really comes in key. So given that the above example is a maximization problem, the optimal solution is that which gives the variables in the objective function the largest zeta value, which graphically means the corner points of the model's graph, which um, increase the size of the shape to its maximal level. Now, optimality can be checked through the tableau by ensuring that all values in the last rows corresponding to the values uh, representing the coefficients of the objective function are non-negative. As you can see in this tableau, we have three negative values, which means that the tableau is yet to be optimal, um, meaning that we still have work to do before reaching optimization, optimality. And this is where the pivot variables come into play. Ide identifying reliable pivot variables are key in identifying and converting the unit variable, leading to the optimization of the linear program. Now, I have the steps here of how to find it, but I'll uh, walk through them step by step um, using uh, a, a, the example tableau from earlier. So you can see that the first step is to identify the column with the, larger, with the most negative or the smallest negative number. In this case, it's the x2 column. Once you have that column in play, you know that the pivot variable will be one of the coefficients in that column. Um, with those coefficients, you then divide the beta value by the coefficients of that column. So you get indicators, as you can see on the right, as 10 over 3, which are beta over the x2 coefficient, and 8 over 5, beta over the x2 coefficient. Um, and then of those two values, you choose the smaller one, which is the 8, 8 over 5 in this case, and that allows you to conclude that the pivot variable in our situation will be 5 in this case, which is the x2 coefficient corresponding to the the stand the slack variables uh function second slack variable function great so now that we have the pivot variable identified we can create the new tableau <clears throat> so to optimize the pivot table essentially what we need to do is transform it into a unit value which is basically the value of one so we multiply the, the row that contains the pivot variable by the reciprocal of the pivot value so in this case it would be 8 over 5, for example, that's what we're multiplying it by. Um, then the, also the other values that are in the second column containing the unit value will become 0 because x2 in this case it, in the second constraint is being optimized. And so they will all become 0. And that's pretty much you know how, how you create the new tableau. So what we can see in this picture here is we have the pivot row, we have the pivot column, um, and we have the new... Um, we have uh, the new pivot variable as well, which is one in this case. In order to keep the tableau equivalent, this is something that's important to note. What we need to do is the other variables that aren't contained in the pivot column or the row have to be calculated using these new pivot values. So for each new value, we multiply the negative of the value in the old pivot column by the value in the new pivot row that respond that sorry that corresponds to the value that's being calculated, and then. We add this one to the old value from the old tableau to produce the new value for the new tableau. Essentially, this is summarized in the equation that's here. So new, table va new tableau value equals the negative value in the old tableau pivot column times the value in the new tableau pivot row added to the old tableau value. So all of this together 
um, gives us the new tableau um, that we've just created in the diagram below. Um, so we have it right over there after having done these steps to it. Now we go back uh, and check for optimality. So this is essentially the same thing that we just did before. Um, the solution is considered optimal if all of the values in the bottom row are greater than or equal to zero. So if we go just briefly right back to the old, um, to the I mean to the tableau that we just created, we can look at the bottom row and we have values that are actually less than zero, which means that this is actually not yet the most optimal tableau. And so we need to um, identify a new pivot variable and then create a new tableau once again until we get to kind of that optimal uh, that optimal um, that optimal thing uh, so in identifying the new pivot variable essentially we're not really doing anything new here um, we're applying the same logic that we have before um, so since the solution is not yet optimal the new pivot variable is basically found using the same uh, row operations to identify which variable will become the unit value and that's kind of a key factor in the conversion of the unit value um, so the intersection of the row and the smallest non-negative indicator and the smallest negative value in the bottom row, that's how we get the new pivot, val uh, the new pivot variable. And in this case, we see uh, that the new pivot variable, you know, we have it identified here, the smallest value being negative six, and then we have the one over five as the new pivot variable. So once again, you know, nothing new, we create the new tableau. Um, we make the pivot variable one by multiplying the row containing the pivot table by the reciprocal of the pivot value. Um, so it's essentially the exact same thing. And then what we do next is we make the other values in the column of the pivot variable zero. So we do that by taking the negative of the old value in the pivot column and multiplying that by the new value in the pivot row and then add that to the old value that's being replaced. So again, the same equation that we used in creating the other tableau is essentially, you know, you keep doing this and you keep pivoting, hence the name, um, until you find the optimal, optimal solution. Now we can check for optimality again. So if you look at the bottom row, once again, if we go right back here, now we have, so we have 0, 31, 0, 8, 1, 64. So actually all of these are greater than or equal to zero, which means, hurrah, we actually have the optimal value. And so checking, optimal, op, uh, checking for the optimality has been a successful um, endeavor. Uh, now what we do is we need to find the optimal values themselves. So this is where things get exciting. What we do is we distinguish between basic and non-basic variables. Essentially, uh, basic variables are ones where there is a single one in the column and all the other, uh, all the other values in the column are zero. Um, and the row that contains the one in that one column is called the beta value, which is actually the optimal solution for the given variable. And the opposite, so anything that's not that is the non-basic variable whose optimal solution would be zero. So we can take the same example we've been looking at and apply that logic now. So looking at this, the basic variables are x1, s1, and z. That's because the columns of x1, s1, and z have one, one, and everything else is zeros. So now let's look at them each one by one and identify um, the actual optimal values. So for x1, the one is in the second row, which corresponds to the eight uh, in the beta column. So if you kind of look at the end of the row, you get the eight. For the S1, um, the S1 actually, like we had mentioned earlier, is a slack variable. So it's actually not included in the objective function. And so it doesn't really play as big of a role in this case. Um, for Z, the one is in the third row. So that corresponds to 64 uh, in the beta column. So essentially, the final solution shows each of the variables having values of X1 being eight, X2, zero, X3, zero, and then S1 is two, S2 is zero, and Z is 64. So what that actually means is the maximum optimal value is 64, and we can find that at eight comma zero comma zero of the objective function. And that's actually exactly how you can find the optimal solution using the simplex algorithm. And we hope you enjoyed that example and that it was useful. Um, now we're gonna move on to some of the applications of the simplex algorithm in real life. So there's multiple uses of simplex theories, wide ranges, and we can use it in multiple fields. Just some examples are game theory, accounting, aviation, operational research, video gaming, 
and even investment decisions. Um, to summarize, anywhere where there's use of linear programming, the simplex method is used extensively. For example, everything from ticket pricing to trip planning to even assigning pilots on a flight. And that's within just one industry. Uh, so it's used quite extensively throughout the world. For the purposes of this video, we're going to just dive into one specific aspect, and that is investment decisions and show you how simplex theory can be used to tackle that. This is an example uh, to guide the discussion on this. We'll be presenting a paper or showing a paper by Emma Okoye, who wrote and pioneered the work on the application of simplex method to accounting decision making. And this is an abstract from her paper. And I'm just going to summarize the main takeaways that um, she wrote in this. What she found was that if we have the assumptions of certainty, linearity, and constant price, then the simplex method can be used to solve accounting problems like capital budgeting, establishing optimum transfer prices, and cost volume profit analysis. And her research has shown that this method can overcome a lot of the major problems which uh, of graphical methods which was the main method used back in the day, which was not useful when you had to solve problems with more than two products. And her analysis and then subsequent adoption in the financial industry has shown that actually the simplex method is a very, it's very useful in guiding management on um, what the maximum or minimum investment in a portfolio should be. So a lot of mutual funds, pension, pension funds, etc., etc., use this to as a as a guiding tool for them this is just one small example of a of a niche field where simplex methods are used extensively but as outlined before you take any industry and you'll see from when you book your flight till when you land on the plane simplex methods will be used extensively so that's a testament to how important they are in our society Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the video.